Good morning. Aren't we off to a great start? This is the innovation segment, the part that's supposed to give you a hunger for changing the world. Vivian has done a beautiful job of asking you to think about change as an exponential force, a force that you can surf, a force that you can be propelled by as long as you embrace it. Lisa came along and made it personal and said that you will only get this to happen here in Mexico if you, in fact, bring the right kind of leadership energy and skills and expectations. And Bodana went further to make it an art. She said you have to embrace the idea of thinking differently, not just improving the known world, but creating a new world. And I'm going to come along and add one more dimension, a dimension that has to do with making innovation a science rather than a vague hope. I have been an innovation scientist for four decades. What I bring to it is the idea that most people screw it up and that if you learn to do it in the ways that actually work, you can get it to happen in a profound and reliable way. That innovation is, unbeknownst to most people, for the first time in history, giving up its secrets and you can learn to master it. Now I've started with the kind of classic image that has been drawn forever some combination of Jetsons and Star Wars. This is an image that has been designed by an architect to envision the future of Mexico and a great and glorious way to live. And places like this, they are inspiring. If you've got a billion dollars to spare, build yourself one of these. But what if that's not the right answer? What if there's a much deeper answer, a deeper answer that's perfect for now, perfect for Mexico, perfect for the future we're hungry for, a future where, as you've been hearing all morning, humanity is at the center, not necessarily technology. Technology is the accelerant and the catalyst, but human beings come and challenge each other about how to live. There was a time, a while ago, when you, this region of the world, was the best in the world at that. Two and three thousand years ago, the Maya civilization showed us all what progress was about. At the time that it was at its peak, it was the best in the world at architecture and astronomy, mathematics and medicine. Did you know the Maya leaders knew, invented probably, surgical techniques? They were sur surgically attaching wounds with human hairs. They were so far advanced that many people have speculated that they might have been a colony derived from somebody arriving from some other planet. Not since Leonardo da Vinci 650 years ago in Italy are we getting to a similar level of strategic advance so far beyond the norms at that time in the world that you have to ask, well, how did they do that? And what can we learn from that? My message to you is that it's time again for a different form of Mexican greatness, a different form of leading the world. And you can do that as you embrace innovation as a science, as a discipline, as an expectation that you can master, you can develop personally, you can make your own, and you can lead with. One of the things Bodana said to us rather brilliantly is don't just improve the world. Quoting Peter Thiel, a zero to one world is different where you originate a different kind of thinking and you challenge each other to be great. I'm going to try to break that down and build it up, but first, just to calibrate, how many of you think we live in the greatest time of change in the history of our species? Show of hands. The overwhelming number of you believe that. The reasons that we believe it are pretty clear by now. For instance, what we see is an extraordinary pattern of disruption everywhere. TV stations are giving way to streaming, uh, taxi services are giving way to ride shares. Um, automobiles are being reinvented around a completely different kind of power plant and a dif different kind of responsibility to coexist with the world. Our ability to sort of create highly profitable, enormous telephone companies is being disruptive by systems that do that for free. And our costly and beautiful shopping centers are giving way to people that will bring us whatever we ask whenever we ask for it at the times that we ask for it in the places we ask for it. These are the things that give us the sense that we live in a time of disruption. 
And there are other pieces of evidence, too. Those of you taking photographs of the slides, you're totally welcome to do so. Please do it. But I've already posted them for you as a gift, OK? So I'm going to reveal unto you where to get the slides at the tail end of the festivities. Maybe we could stay in the conversation with one another for a minute or two, OK? When I, one of the things that I think is so important is to also see that the pattern of disruption is very interesting in the way we've learned to de-risk it. As you sit here today, what you should know is that there are literally 2.8 million apps for your Android device and 2.2 million for your iOS device. These transformations, this appification of the world, is important because if you're a company, it may, gives you a very low-cost, low-risk way to reach billions of potential consumers. And if you're a consumer, you're an individual trying to run your busy life and do something with your family, any individual capability is cheap and easy for you to try, and you can see if it's useful to you. You can ignore the ones that aren't, and you can embrace and embed the ones that are useful. The way that works, of course, is that we hear about the cool ones from our buddies, and we download them and install them in our devices, and from that point on, they sort of manage themselves. Unlike the PC world of 20 years ago, this thing is a really unusual ecosystem. It's asset light, it's smart, it's rated, it's open, it's porous, it's distributed. All the individual little tools get better pretty regularly, weekly. And they do that because, as millions of people use them, there are special routines that figure out when they're making errors. Not you, but the software. And those things are then analyzed and sent back to the programming team. So if I'm a programming leader of a team that has an app, I receive reports every day of what issues people are having with it. And it even jumps into the level of code to tell me what's likely the cause and what I should be working on improving next. This is a profoundly different thing that's never existed before. And it's the reason why our pace of change feels so different and feels so novel. But there's a problem with this, ladies and gentlemen. It goes like this. When we're asked to innovate, we tend to not know what to do, and we're usually galvanized right into inactivity. You're going to hear an awful lot about exponential change, and your challenge to sort of change the world for a billion people. And for most of you, I know what this is going to do. It's going to create a sense of fatigue, anxiety, and low-level trauma that will reach its zenith sometime tomorrow. You're going to want to go back home, climb into bed, and pull the covers over your head. Okay? And what I want you to do instead is to recognize that actually we all go through that. We're all vaguely in favor of innovation in theory, but in practice it scares the hell out of us. And we try to return life to whatever is familiar and comfortable, what we've succeeded with in the past. And there are two overwhelming problems that reoccur for almost every firm, almost every government, almost every industry, and they're very basic. The first thing is people don't know what they should create. They sit in a room, they brainstorm, you know, really sophisticated methods, they vote with sticky dots, and they sort of think, well, design thinking will save us here. And I'm here to tell you that it tends to produce very ordinary ideas, a bad wheat to chaff ratio, and an extremely low record of success. Extremely low, like less than 4%. It's roughly where medicine was when leeches were the really big deal. Okay? And so I want you to be skeptical about that. And even if unlikely enough, you do guess at the right thing that human beings might need next, the next problem you're going to have is you won't actually know how to do that. You'll guess, you know, you'll sort of see what you can create, you'll spend some time creating some technology, and by and large, you will make errors about that. So not knowing the right thing to do and not knowing the right way to do it is the central problem, and I'm going to try to double-click on both of those in the few minutes that I have to break down for you, as a science, what it means to innovate in the right ways, we'll do that first, and then to innovate on the right things, especially in an extraordinary time of change, and especially in a way that might embrace a completely new form of leadership in Latin America that Mexico can be the proud architects of. So I got a couple little things I want to cover in a few minutes, and it's a really big deal to try to get it right. 
When you download these slides, and I hope you will, what I hope you'll discover is that it's a very practical way for you to take the idea of exponential change, the notion that it's personal and you have to lead it, the idea that you have to think differently, not conventionally, and turn it into a set of mechanical activities that are likely to succeed instead of fail. Let me begin here with the idea that innovation is giving up its secrets, that when you use the right methods and tools, the fact that it's always tough, especially tough, to be a bold, global, transformational leader, this is how you get it to succeed instead of fail. I wrote a book about this topic. Uh, this is not a sales pitch for the book. In fact, it's a rueful admission of stupidity because I spent five years on the damn book, spent a lot of money on it and tried to get it right. Late in the development, somewhere in the fourth year, I come out of my little closet where I was writing, blinking like a gopher. I kept it dark in there. One of my anthropologists, remembering vaguely that I started the company some time ago, thought she was supposed to be polite. And she said, how's that book thing coming? I thought she was sincere, so I tried to give her an actual answer, you know. So the data in chapter 14 is kind of kicking my ass. And so I noticed that she was trying to get away from me, backing up, you know, looking at her phone like, stay away from me, crazy guy. And, um, and, 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 and yet, because she's an anthropologist, she nevertheless turned over her shoulder and said something to me that was a life gift. She said, you know, nobody reads books anymore, right? And I thought, shit, that's why you hire anthropologists. They remind you how the world actually works. So don't feel bad about not owning or reading the book, ladies and gentlemen. It is a, an attempt to break down what we know about innovation and how to get it to succeed. And I'll give you distilled the critical discovery in the book right now. There was an actual methodology behind this using one of the world's leading methodologists, Vijay Kumar, we gathered up more than 1,200 innovations that historically had transformed the entire world. Things like the Model T Ford or penicillin, the idea of the internet, extraordinarily diverse things. And as I say, 1,200 of them, over 200 years of history. And Vijay Kumar's job was to figure out if they had anything in common. And he kept putting them in computers and distilling them using pattern recognition and cluster analytics. Eventually, he comes out of his little closet and he says, hey, I think I found something. I said, do tell. And he said, it turns out there have always been, unbeknownst to us, 10 distinct types of innovation. Now, color at Doblin is never decorative and never random. So these colors actually matter a lot and they indicate where you go in the world to master each of these entire domains, ways to think, ways to build the future and to get it to show up somewhat ahead of its regularly scheduled arrival. That stuff over there in blue, that's taught in the better business schools. The stuff in gold, it's taught in engineering schools. The stuff in red, it is taught in design or social science schools, and nobody has the time or the money to get all those advanced degrees, and if you did, You'd be an egghead, and the rest of us would really resent you, okay? So you don't have to master all this, but you do need to know that it's the heart of every breakthrough in history. You've got to balance the business model, the actual technical elegance, and the way in which human beings come to embrace it. And when you learn to do that with the right methods and tools and systems, what you get is a smaller number of bigger ideas that are much easier for you to implement because you know what matters, and then they're harder for other people to copy. Bolder ideas, easier to implement, harder to copy. That is the basis, ladies and gentlemen, for creating your own exponential future in a way that changes the world and ends up succeeding over time. Let me make that more personal for you. The way in which breakthroughs manifest in the world is always the same. Number one, they have to be culturally cool. People have to say, wow, this is totally changing my life. This is important to me. How many of you saw the Black Panther movie when it came out this year? Yeah. I want to remind you about something in the Black Panther movie. It was set in a place in the world that is not normally cited as the origin place for really positive stories. It was set in Africa. Now, to be fair, 
a mythological country in Africa, Wakanda, and centered around a non-existent element called vibranium, okay? But it created this very positive, culturally cool story that people the world over were excited to embrace. Black Panther. What's my evidence? It stayed on the number one slot in global movie box office for six weeks a phenomenon that has not occurred in 30 years. This is a story that inspired people. Another thing that's important in all great innovations is some kind of technology that's remarkable. Whatever you might think of Elon Musk, what's amazing about him is he constantly surprises us with capabilities. If you're lucky enough to have a Tesla, one of the things you can do when it's parked in your garage, if your garage door is open, is you can push a button and say, come to me. And it will, all by itself. That's because it already has all of the capabilities to be a self-driving vehicle. It just can't be legally turned on in most countries. And the third thing is that you have to create something that is perceived by users as a fair, maybe even slightly magical business model. Remember the first time you ever typed something in to a Google search engine box. First off, it's simple and elegant and beautiful. And second, in an average of 0.2 seconds, you get what appears to be everything the world knows about whatever question you asked, and that costs you nothing. This is what we look for in real breakthroughs, something that's culturally cool, technically elegant, and perceived as a fair business model, and that is the base requirement to make sure that your exponential transformation gets its unfair share of attention, gets noticed in the world, and actually functions in a way that people care about. This is the genetic code of greatness, ladies and gentlemen. Now, when you do that mechanically, what you do is you ask your engineers to say, okay, well, what's possible? What used to be costly or hard or rare that we can now do routinely and reliably and robustly? That's the question for engineers. With your business leaders, what you say is, how do I turn that into a machine so that it just keeps throwing off enough free cash flow to earn me the privilege of doing it over again. And with your anthropologists and your designers, you have to always ask the question, is that something human beings would love? Would they be grateful for it? Would they like to live in that world? Can we do it in a way that's fair and generous? That gets you to what's next. Oh, by the way, as thoughtful leaders, especially in this part of the world that's not really happening in my country, I'm very embarrassed and sad to say. We also need to be asking the question, what do we do to make that sustainable so that the world gets safer and better over time? You're going to hear about great sustainability uh, you know, innovations and ecosystems coming along in the next two days, but I want to give you the sense that all of the ideas that you have in your head and in your heart will be powered globally when you learn to break them down this way. Five or more types of innovation out of 10, all three colors. So you have to have elegant technology, a fair business model, and a great experience, and do something that others are not yet doing, as Bodana challenged us to do. Think as an original person, not just making something known and better. Let's illustrate that with Airbnb. How many of you have ever been guests in an Airbnb? And how many of you are lucky enough to be the host of an Airbnb and using it as a source of income. Okay, that's pretty much what I would have expected in this room. Airbnb just hit its 10th anniversary. From the very beginning, it was using five types of innovation. So back when it was nothing, using this way of thinking, you could have predicted that it would likely be a success. What no one would have predicted, even with good innovation diagnostics, is how rapidly it would come along to change the world. So in just six years, Airbnb went from no place to being significantly larger than all three of the three largest global hotel chains combined, scaring the heck out of everybody that's got global hotel chains. Now here's the important thing. I really want you to listen carefully to this because this is where great innovators, leaders, people that want to change the world, this is where they break their pick. They think they're supposed to be geniuses or gadflies or rocket scientists or, you know, Nobel Prize winners, or at the very least, MacArthur Genius Grant winners. How many Nobel Prize winners do we have in the room? Okay, that's what I would have expected. Not so many. And yet, I'm expecting you to be great innovators anyway. 
Now, how do you do that? Let me show you specifically how Airbnb does it. This is the tech stack of Airbnb. I'm revealing to you now the exact way the organization functions. This is what we can build at Deloitte for any company, any industry, any vertical, anywhere in the world, and do so all the time. There is nothing terribly original in this. This is what your teenagers know how to do if you taught them well and gave them Lego building bricks. These are the grown-up Lego building bricks. No one should ever start a company and say, I have to invent the technology from scratch anymore. If you're crazy enough to do that, it will take you six to 10 years longer, and you will immediately get sued for patent infringements on the day you start your business. It's a disaster to do it that way. Instead, what you do is you find in places like Hadoop, GitHub, tech, tech, uh, Stackshare, all the things that are going to make your business do what it needs to do. Now, if there was somebody from the programming team inside of Airbnb, they would say, now, hang on a second, Larry. We've got original stuff here, secret sauce, things that we know how to do that others don't know how to do. So let's just honor that. Out of the 57 capabilities that make Airbnb function each and every day, one of the application and data capabilities is slightly proprietary. Two of the DevOps are slightly proprietary. Three of the utilities are slightly proprietary. And one of the business tools is slightly proprietary. So I went to one of my you know, tech building geniuses in Deloitte, and I said, so how long would it take you to do workarounds for these seven capabilities? And he was hungry, and he said, can I have lunch? And I said, sure, dude. You know, Knock yourself out. He thought I wanted him to build it, and I just wanted to know how long it would take. When we finally stopped confusing one another, he said, you know, if I skip lunch, I can build you workarounds in three hours, but if I can have lunch, I can have it done in five hours. Will that be enough for you? So ladies and gentlemen, if you're sitting there thinking, I don't know how to build an Airbnb capability or anything that allows assets to be shared without having to own them, I've just shown you how. I've also taught you that there's nothing terribly original about it. The same exact truism can be applied to anything you're actually impressed with. The, the tech stack at Uber has almost nothing proprietary in it. They've got exactly one patent that they earned five years into their business. Okay? Now let's talk about something more. The questions as an innovator you need to be able to ask are these. How are we doing? What are, are we working on the right problem? Do we know how to define and measure it? You know, what specific concepts are we trying to pursue? Those questions are the ones that good leaders should be asking. And in black is the associated tradecraft that allows you to do it. There are methods and tools and systems available now to crack mechanically literally any of the complicated problems of innovation. And then what does that mean? What that means is that as you try to innovate, as you try to surf the waves you're going to be learning about today and tomorrow, what you want to do is frame a useful problem, create some kind of way of tackling it, diagnose what people are already doing, build yourself a platform or an ecosystem that works, understand what it's going to take to deliver on that, use clouds, crowds, partners, and prizes to make that cheap, and then create, as you'll learn from John Hagel, ways to think about the edge, the places in the world where that invol it's involved, and the metrics, incentives, and rewards, or the think tanks and decision environments that will get you to succeed. These are the roughly dozen tools that all great innovators now learn to master. And why that matters is because it pays off. If you don't know anything about the field of innovation effectiveness, I'm laying it out for you now on a single slide. Okay? There's kind of a good level of capabilities. I think of those as hygiene. A better level of actually getting your aspirations to change the world to take root. And a top level that allows you to do it with the human beings that are on your team. The basic thing you should know is that if you don't know anything about these capabilities, brainstorming and design thinking and prototype building gets you a success rate that hovers around 4.5%. That is horrible and not worth anybody taking any risks. Use the tools at the bottom. 
you'll get a 35% success rate. Add the tools in the middle after that, you'll get a 50% success rate. Add the tools at the top, you get a 70% success rate. Ladies and gentlemen, innovation is no longer mysterious, no longer hard, but please, please embrace it so that you're doing it in the way that's likely to succeed instead of fail. All right, that's the first part. Intended to be a gift that helps you to not be anxious over the next day and a half now as you think about how you're going to change the world and embrace the spirit of transformation. What does it mean to innovate on something that the world really cares about? How do we become transformational and think beyond the idea of mere technology? One of the things that is going to happen to you is you're going to hear an awful lot about exciting things, artificial intelligence and robotics and all the catalysts and accelerants of transformation. Sadly, what most people think about that is, I want to create an amazing new tech company and get it to be a wild success. And occasionally, very occasionally, that actually happens. Not long ago, I'm in Hong Kong. I'm walking by a billboard roughly the size of half of this stage, and it's lit up so that if I were standing there, I would be a tiny little figure next to it. And the thing that struck me was that little message way at the bottom that says over 600 million daily transactions. WeChat Pay didn't exist, ladies and gentlemen, in the old days three years ago. And so this is the thing that causes us to all say, I want me one of those. I want one of those things that just goes through the roof like Peter Thiel did with PayPal, okay? Now, the way that normally is impressed upon you is people give you all this technobabble to think about. Let me astonish you with natural language programming or artificial, and artificial uh, reality and virtual reality or behavioral finance or crypto strategies and, and Bitcoin. And yes, those things are all important, but I want to give you a sense of how you make them human again, especially in the way that that matters. When I work with financial services firms the world over, what I tell them is to put technology in its place, to understand that it is actually important, but there's something much more important than that. Okay? What matters is to be able to say, I want fintech so I can be faster, and then I want regtech so that I can comply with government expectations and be safer. And then I want to make it much more human and much more personal for each and every individual customer. And then I want to use partners so that I'm surprising. So yes, the technologies matters, ladies and gentlemen, they really do. But you know what really matters if you want to be a great leader is to make the world faster, safer, more personal, and more surprising. That's how you humanize technology, embrace it at the right level of spirit, at the right level of leadership, and the right level of heart. Let me illustrate. How many of you have never heard of Rich Barton so I can calibrate? Please be honest. Yeah, almost all of you. So you might know this. Some of our American billionaires are complete assholes and are a real pain in the ass to sort of coexist with. I'm not naming any specific ones. but. Rich Barton is sort of the opposite of that. He's the billionaire nobody's ever heard of because he's created three separate unicorn companies that all were sold for more than a billion dollars apiece. And nobody's ever heard of him. What did he do? Well, the first thing he said is, why is it no one can tell me what it costs specifically to fly from, let's say, here in Puerto Vallarta to San Francisco. At the time he was asking that question, you had to go to an abstruse specialist, a travel agent, who pulled up a screen filled with green data and tried to peer through it all and tell him what the price tag was. He thought that was stupid, so he created Expedia. This and Travelocity transformed how we do travel planning. Now he sold Expedia to Microsoft for more than a billion dollars. About that time, he discovered he had no idea when he could afford a better house, what the fair price was for his house, or the house he wanted to buy. He had to go to an abstruse set of specialists, a realtor, and they would do magic incantations and tell him what the price tag would be for each of those things. And he thought that was stupid, so he created Zillow, which transformed our ability to know reasonably transparently the fair value of our real estate, and after that, 
he decided he wanted to know if it would be cool or not cool to work in different kinds of firms. And he created Glassdoor. But notice the logic. Every single time he's taking something that's a black box and turning it into a glass box. In modern 21st century living, this is what human beings expect. I want to understand it. I want to have agency. I want to be in charge of my own life. I want to make better decisions. The other thing that people want is a shot at making life better for their families. This is a little piece of analysis I did for you on the gig economy. Asking the question, how many gig economy companies have been created that are unicorns that are worth more than a billion dollars so far? Well, nine of them have come from California, one from Texas, three from New York, including WeWork, which has got a booth right outside the door here, only one from the UK, only one from India, only one from China, one from Australia, and shockingly, in a country where they have more sheep than people, one from New Zealand. But here's the deal. If I come back here a year from now, our predictive analytics at Deloitte tell us there will be 17 to 22 more unicorn companies driving the gig economy. Turns out what people want, and this is another thing Peter Thiel got right, is not to be saddled with vast amounts of debt for an undergraduate degree that doesn't necessarily pay off. The critical thing about gig economy companies is they allow you to make life better for your family. So you can become a Lyft driver, an Uber driver, you can take your craft work and sell it at Etsy, you can do things to start your own ideas inside of a WeWork place, you can sell what you already own on eBay. These are gig economy businesses, but they have a little problem. You can work really hard, long hours at Uber, and you still won't know after your gerbil wheel is spinning as fast as it can if your life is going to be okay, if you're going to be safe this month and this quarter and this year. And you probably, if you live in my country, won't be able to afford health care. This is crazy and needs to be fixed. And you can fix it. I've shown you how. The idea of creating something that has its heart in the right place. Remember, in the mythical country of Wakanda, Something interesting went on. It was women that ran the politics and the technology. The guys fought the fights, the silly fights, right? And the technology and the politics were really interesting and really inspiring, and I think that's your future. I think that you can re-listen to the Maya leaders and think about how to address it. It's easier than you think. Tiny little Estonia did something to create the most switched on government on planet Earth. And it did it with two simple mechanical things. Item number one, every citizen was given a digital ID card. And every department was told that they had to embrace the digital ID card and share a single technical backbone that they all had to share. No more, well, our department has a different technology platform. So there's the technical platform backbone. All of that is mechanical, right? You give the citizens an ID card and you require that every department of the government use it. You want to know what was genius? They said to the government bureaucrats, you know what your budget is next year? Zero. You know how you get budget next year? You prove that you did something that uses the digital ID card that the citizens are grateful for. Holy shit. All of a sudden, the bureaucrats had a reason to care whether or not the citizens were grateful for what the government was doing. And it radically transformed the rate of change and showed us all a way to get change to happen differently and faster and more boldly than ever before. For Mexico, I got a little guess. It's reckless. This is my crystal ball moment. It's probably wrong, but hey. You're going to have a break in just a few minutes, and this is your chance to sort of improve on it and tell me and everybody else in the room what I missed. The first thing is you've got to change your rate of change, because we all do. We're all moving too slowly. All governments, all sectors, all companies, all individual teams. We have to pick up the pace. You're going to get an awful lot of that message. It'll be annoying by the time we're done with you tomorrow afternoon. The second thing is, after picking up the pace, what if 
you don't buy into the conventional definitions of success. Do you know that most of the world is addicted to things like gross domestic product? Not in your part of the world, tiny little Costa Rica. Costa Rica has most of the metrics that matter in the country built around gross domestic happiness. Are you aware that Costa Rica just edged out Bhutan for number one in the world in, the ter in terms of citizen satisfaction and the quality of life that they're leading? I don't think the future for you is necessarily about gross domestic product. I do think it's about creating a better life for your citizens. And this is a moment when the entire world is saying, what's my gig economy? How do I make that easier? And I think you can create extraordinarily exciting new ecosystems that make it easier for people to do new things here in Mexico than anywhere else and than ever before. And if you do that with the kinds of methods and tools and systems you'll be learning about today and tomorrow, you will get yourself some badass breakthroughs that transform the world that are as newsworthy and game-changing as any organization, any region of the world has ever done, and that can reassert your extraordinary time of human leadership once again that you last had 2,500 years ago. If you want these notes, send an email to support at doblin.com and mention anything about SU Mexico, and somebody smart will send you the file, okay? It's really all about giving you a sense that getting the future to show up somewhat ahead of its regularly scheduled arrival is in your hands. It doesn't have to be scary. It doesn't have to be mysterious. You do have to embrace it and make it personal. 58 years ago, George Bernard Shaw wrote, God may have made this world, but that's no excuse for us not to make it better. That's why I've been in the innovation field for four decades. It's why I'm still excited about it now. It's why I think it's the best and most beautiful way to embrace exponential change and make it your own and create a real difference for the people of Mexico. Thank you very much.